Good evening all. Shall we turn again to Genesis in chapter 1? One or two people have said to me this is the first time they've heard this kind of ministry. If, you're, if you have enjoyed what you hear, on, on our own website back home we have an apologetics section. And there are ministry messages on there by various people. Ian Jackson, who's been mentioned, Dr. Burke Cargill is on there, and one or two others. So if you go to hebrongospelhall.org, H-E-B-R-O-N, hebrongospelhall.org, click on the audio button, and then there will be a section on your right called Apologetics. And if you click on there, you'll get quite a lot of, a number of MP3 messages on apologetics and so on. There's another uh, website that we maintain called webtruth, webtruth.org, and on there there's some articles on a scientific bent as well. So hopefully, if you're interested, those things will be useful to you. Now, we've been going in chronological order this evening through the day. So we started back in eternity with the God of truth. Then the next stage is, how did the universe come to be, the origin of the universe? Then the next stage is, okay, so now we have a universe. Where did life come from? How did life come from? Now we're moving on. We're presuming that we've got life. But what about all the variety of life, all the different species of bird and plant and animal and so on? How did that all come to be? We know how it came to be on a Bible point of view. How, how do the evolutionists view it? And what's wrong with what they're saying? Can we mix the two? Can we choose a bit of creation, a bit of evolution, and have what's called theistic evolution? So we're going to look at some of those issues tonight and hopefully it'll be of interest. I do have a few more slides than usual because it's quite technical, and also I want you to stay awake after a, a good supper and the last end of the day. So Genesis chapter 1, we're going to notice some interesting things here. Verse 21, God created great whales, and every living creature that moveth, which the waters brought forth abundantly. Now notice the next three words, after their kind. According to their kind, we're going to have to find out what that means. And every winged fowl after his kind. And God saw that it was good. Look down to verse 25. And God made the beast of the earth after his kind. And the cattle after their kind. And every thing that creepeth upon the earth after his kind. And God saw that it was good. I think I counted up ten I haven't read them all, but I think I counted up 10 references in Genesis 1 to this expression, according to their kind. That's a very vital expression, and it's not there for no reason. Now, come to Psalms, please. Psalm 94, the 94th Psalm. And verse 9. Well, we're getting progress here. We've got ice in the water tonight. Thank you for whoever did that. Psalm 94, verse 9. He that planted the ear. It's talking about God. He that planted the ear, shall he not hear? He that formed the eye, shall he not see? Just forward to Psalm 139, please. Very famous verse in Psalm 139, verse 14. This is actually a passage of scripture that talks about the child developing in the womb. Imagine, imagine that 3,000 years ago there is a passage of scripture which talks about the developing embryo in the mother's womb. Uh, Psalm 139. Verse four, uh, 13, for thou hast possessed my reins, thou hast covered me in my mother's womb. I will praise thee, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. He's talking about the human body and uh, the design of it. Marvelous are thy works, that my soul knoweth right well. My substance was not hid from thee when I was made in secret. And curiously wrought in the lowest parts of the earth. That is a figurative expression for his mother's womb. Thou didst see my substance. Okay, two more references in the New Testament. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, please. 
There are surprisingly more verses about this subject than you think. Uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and verse 18. The Apostle Paul in this chapter is speaking about the human body as a picture of the local assembly. And he says in verse 18 about the human body, but now God hath uh, hath God set the members, he's talking about arms, eyes, ears, and so on. You can see that from the context in verse 16, 15, 17, and so on. God has set the members, everyone in the body, as it has pleased him. So it's talking about how God designed the human body. Finally, in the same book, chapter 15, verse 30. He's talking now, again, he's, in the context it's about the resurrection, but he brings in the issue of plants. How do plants grow? And he's talking about sowing in verse 36, and then verse 37. That which thou sowest, so he's thinking of a farmer going out into the field sowing crops. Thou sowest not that body that shall be, but bear grain. It may be chance wheat or some other grain. But God giveth it a body as it has pleased him. To every seed, his own body. So there's a reference to the design of plants in our New Testament. So may the Lord bless to us the reading of those few verses, and we'll refer to some more as we go along. Mr. Darwin uh, wrote that book, Origin of Species. Charles Darwin, Origin of Species. So he's not even answering the question in that book, The Origin of Life. He's assuming life. And now he's trying to explain how there's all these different types of plants and animals without a creator God. He didn't specifically attack the idea of God. He even mentions the word God on the last page of the book. But it was an attempt to give an alternative explanation to how all of nature came to be. Now, any thinking person has got to come up with some kind of explanation. So we've got thousands of species of animals and plants and fungi and bacteria and algae. You've got to be just mind-bogglingly amazed at the variety. So, So think of the eye, the ear. I mean, we could spend the whole night on either of those, no problem. I mean, right now, I'm talking to you, and something's happening in this little voice box here, and somehow, when my lips move and this voice box rattles, the air between me and your ear somehow is vibrating, and this ear of yours somehow has something in here which picks that all up. All of you are picking that all up, even though I'm distant from you. picks it up absolutely crystal clear. And somehow, you have this three-pound matter of spongy substance in your head that somehow is able to take that and turn it into a language somehow that you understand. And if I tell you a sad story, that then causes tears to run down your face. If I tell you a funny story, you start to laugh. And this is... I mean, when you stop to think about it, it's the most amazing thing. And, and you really have to have an explanation. How is that the case? So so in this brain of ours, we've got 100 billion neurons connected by 100 trillion synapses. So it's the most complicated object in the universe. It's right there between your ears. The most... Makes this thing here just like... This is something called picnic compared with what's up here. This is the most complicated object in the universe. So, So where did all this stuff come from? Then we have photosynthesis pollination, metamorphosis. Have you ever seen a caterpillar turn into a butterfly? Okay, come on now. How did that happen? Migration. So then we have to explain the nervous system, the lymphatic system, blood circulation, blood clotting. If you want to read an interesting book on blood clotting, get Michael Behe's book, the, uh, Darwin's Black Box. He, he, he explains blood clotting as this 
incredibly irreducibly complex cascade of like 18 different reactions to clot your blood. Fascinating book. I mean, even just like breathing, balance, flight, speech, consciousness. What about reproduction? I read a fascinating statement. I just really loved it. I wrote it down. A fertilized human egg makes a journey as complex as the path of a golf ball that rolls 30 miles and lands precisely in the 18th hole of a golf course it has never seen. I, I just like that kind of thing. You know, how, 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 does, how does this all come to be? Well, what does the Bible say? Well, according to Genesis 1, we have two statements there which tell us how God designed it. So God designed plants and animals and, and ourselves. This is what it says. Whose seed is in itself. Imagine if you could go to a shop and buy something whose seed is in itself. You know, like an iPhone or something. Or this little computer thing. You just buy this and... You never have to buy another one because it just re reproduces another one once, once it gets worn out. A seed is in itself. That's what God did. God created plants and animals and humans. And within us, we have everything we need to produce an exact replica of ourselves. I've done that twice. I have a 21-year-old replica and an 18-year-old replica. It's unbelievable. So we have this, this idea, whose seed is in itself. Then we have this other expression where it says that they will reproduce after their kind, according to their kind. So God has designed us so that we have within us the capability to reproduce ourselves and that reproduced item will be exactly like us. It'll be according to its kind. So thankfully, we never go to the hospital and find, oh, we've given birth to a non-human. No, 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 we know exactly what's coming because it's according to the seed, which is in itself, DNA and so on, and we're going to get exactly what we expect. Now, this uh, DNA that we have in, in, inside ourselves so in the reproductive cells, as uh, the egg is fertilized and so on, God has designed this code, this genetic code, so that the next generation will continue. There's, there's incredible continuity and stability and longevity in this code. It's been going on for thousands of years, and it just, you just expect that your child will have everything that you have, all the, all the very bodily parts and so on. But just step back for a minute and think of the miracle of that. That replication has just been going on for centuries and centuries and centuries. And it's clear, as we look across nature, as we look at plants, fungi, algae, uh, animals, humans, as we look across, there's no doubt that it gives a very strong message of design. So Richard Dawkins, poor old Richard Dawkins, we keep slagging him off, poor fella. Richard Dawkins, he says in his book, The Blind Watchmaker, that things look like they are designed. He even admits that. So he's, he's saying that nature gives the appearance of being designed. Now notice what he's saying here. He's not saying that nature is designed. He says that nature gives the appearance of being designed. That's very important, and we'll look at that. But before we get on, I just want to have some fun with this design idea. Because I, I, I really have enjoyed some things that I've discovered in preparing for this. So let me just show you some design, just, just for fun. So this is bacterium. Bacteria is plural, bacterium is singular. This is a little bacterium that, that you don't want to get. It's called E. coli. So you can see on your left, that is a real 
photograph of blown up, blown up, very, very big. You wouldn't be able to see it in real life. It was tiny, tiny, tiny thing. So this is a bacterium. You can imagine Mr. Darwin looking at this bacterium years ago and thinking, well, a simple blob of goo with a tail. Things have changed since then because at the point where the flagellum, this whip-like appendage, at the point where it joins the dark E. coli bacterium, at that point where it joins, this is a diagram of what it really is like on the inside. So on the right hand side, you are looking at a cutaway diagram of one of these filaments. So the arrow is pointing to the filament. That green filament is the same thing. And where it joins the E. coli, this is what it looks like. You say, that looks like an, like an outboard motor or something. That, that's exactly what it is. So this E. coli has a flagella on the back. It, it, it actually propels this bacterium around the body or wherever it's going to go. So same as you might have a speedboat and you put your outboard motor on the back and you pull it. and it, it, This flagellum thing, it spins and along goes the... So it's just, it does, just doesn't wave like one of the hairs sticking out of your head. This actually is a motor. It is a highly complex molecular machine. Did you get that word? Machine. It's, it's built out of proteins. So that means it's got to have DNA to build the proteins. So we're already getting very complicated here. It has a rotor, a stator, and a switch. And this spiral propeller is attached by a universal joint that propels it along. So how do you run the motor? You know, do you, what, what does it run on, gas or petrol, or what does it run on? Well, it, it runs on protons. So the torque for the rotation of this flagellum is provided by an inward proton flow. Now let me just tell you how narrow this little flagellum, the green flagellum is, it's 20 nanometers across. That's very small. It's like a human hair would be very big compared with that. It's absolutely... Can you, can you believe that there is in nature a machine, like an outboard motor, that is so small, you could, you could fit a million of them on the end of a pin. Imagine if you went to Mars. They're talking about going to Mars now. So they're going to go to Mars. Imagine if you went to Mars and you found lying on the floor an outboard motor. What would you say? Came here by chance? No, you'd immediately say, whoa, there's people up here. Must be. Because you cannot see that kind of complexity without a designer. Oh, but wait. <laughs> I discovered this in preparing for this meeting. I didn't know about this till yesterday. I can show you something seven times more complex than that. Let me show you it here. So this is the E. coli. Let me show you another bacterium. It's called the MO-1 marine bacterium. It has seven of these motors, right? So... This is an actual, uh, highly blown up image looking down the end. So, it, so the bacterium is coming along and coming out of its back is these seven flagella. Someone has come on the end and taken a photograph of it there and that's what you're seeing. So these are the seven flagella. And then someone has drawn over it the skin. So here's your seven in orange, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Now he's blown it up big. So in orange are the ends of the seven spinning flagellum, flagella, and in between them in green are some more cogs which synchronize with the seven. This is unbelievable. 
It has seven synchronized motors. The seven motors rotate one way. Can you see the arrows? Whereas the smaller gears rotate the opposite way. Now the reason is that is to maximize the torque while minimizing the friction. So, this little guy here, the M01, he can swim 10 times faster than this guy. Somebody said he's the Ferrari of the flagella. <laughs> now, this simple motor has more parts than a Boeing 747. But it can do something that the Boeing 747 cannot do. It can reproduce itself. <laughs> Imagine, that would save you some money if you could just get your Boeing to reproduce itself. <laughs> I could go on about this all night. This is, this is great, but we, we, won't, we won't have the luxury. But let me show you something else. I'm going to show you a bug, tiny, tiny bug. It's, a quarter, it's half the size of a fire ant. If you know what a fire ant is, now you know how big this bug is. It has mechanical gears that run its back legs. And I'm going to show you a, a highly uh, magnified actual photograph of the gears that run the legs of this bug. The bug is called the Issus. I had never heard of it till yesterday. The Issus bug. So there's the bug on the, on the left. See its back leg, one of its back legs sticking out there. So it's the two back legs. At the top of the back legs, you have this gear. So this is a highly, highly, highly magnified section of the top of its legs. It sits down, and those gears intermesh. And when it wants to get out of the way, in two milliseconds, it jumps. Now, this is the, it can ju jump at 400 Gs. You say, what is 400 Gs? That is 20 times what the human body can stand in. You know, if you were to go in a centrifuge and you, they spin you around and you start to you know, faint and the blood goes everywhere. So, 400 Gs is 20 times what the human... It can take off at eight miles an hour. And it is half the size of a fire ant. That's some set of gears. That is some set of gears. Now, that has to be coded for by DNA. So in the DNA, the, the nucleotides, the four, they have to join up in such a way that when that bug gives birth to another bug, its baby has gears. So the DNA has to tell the proteins, tell this growing uh, offspring to produce that. There's code for that. There's a language for that in the DNA of the parent. Now, if you saw a set of gears just lying on the side here, just a very simple set of interlocking gears, like you'd have in an old-fashioned watch or something. You wouldn't think for one minute that it happened by chance. You wouldn't think for one minute that it just came there slowly by accident. You would immediately recognize design. So common sense would tell us that a factory needs a builder, a machine needs a designer, a language needs an author. And this was the huge problem for atheists up until 1859. Wouldn't it be good to be back before 1859? So you can imagine the conversation in 1858. So your next door neighbor is an atheist. And you go around and have a cup of tea with him. And so, he's, so how are you getting? Oh, I'm still an atheist. And you say to him, oh, okay. So how did we come to be then? So how did the eagle get its wings? How did the elephant get its trunk? Ha <laughs> ha, you don't know. God created it all. And the atheist just like, oh, I wish I had an answer to this. There was no answer. Now, evolution was in the air, and different people were talking about Darwin's grandfather, or they'd been thinking about it and writing kind of 
proto books on it and so on. But it was in 1859 that finally, when Darwin published his book, The Origin of Species, the atheistic community finally had an alternative. They had a lie with which to exchange the truth. They've now got something. So if you go to the Natural History Museum in uh, London, which is, a, which is a temple to Darwinism, there is a Darwin exhibit, and I've been round it. If you, you need to take some... Uh, Take something before you go around it because it will really, really do your head in. As, as you go in, there's a statue of Darwin. This man who rejects the revelation of Scripture and does not believe Jesus is the Son of God. And he's sitting there reading a book. And behind him, there's a, there's a sign. I don't know whether you can see it or not. It says on it, the problem Darwin solved. So this guy Darwin... They're looking to him as the man who solved the problem. Well, what was the problem he solved? Well, the problem he solved was people were saying, well, maybe there's an alternative to creation. Maybe things just evolved and changed. But they didn't have an explanation for that. There was no credible sort of way of saying, well, this is how it happened. It's one thing to say man came from the monkeys or from the apes. But it's another thing to explain how did that happen. So Mr. Darwin came up with the theory of evolution. And the world has never been the same since. Now what is this? Richard Dawkins called it the greatest thought that ever came into a man's mind. That's Dawkins talking about Darwin. So Darwin thought of something called natural selection and Dawkins thinks that's the greatest thought that ever came into a man's mind. I think the greatest thought that ever came into my mind was, Jesus loves me this, I know, for the Bible tells me so. Amen. However, let's get back to the subject. Natural selection. You say, what is natural? I've heard of natural selection. I have no idea what natural selection is. Well, let me try and explain it as best as I can. When we talk about natural selection, we're thinking of nature... So the conditions in the world, selecting, so this is unintelligent selecting, but favoring certain adaptations. So let's just imagine uh, a bear gives birth to three or four cubs, and he's living up near the North Pole somewhere. One cub is born with quite a thin covering of hair, not very much, but the one of the other cubs has come out all bushy and woolly like Esau, and he, he's got loads of hair. And What's nature going to do with these two cubs? If they're living up near, what's nature going to do? Well, nature's going to select. And nature's not actually deciding, I'm going to do this. But, but this is the idea. Nature's going to select the, the, the cub with the thick, woolly hair, and the one with the thin hair is just going to die. And so the one with the thick woolly hair survives, reproduces, and is therefore more likely to produce cubs that have thick hair, and so on. You get the idea. Uh, another idea would be, another suggestion would be in the jungle. So a gazelle gives birth and has various offspring. The one with the fastest running legs is likely the one that's going to survive, and so eventually you're going to get faster and faster and faster legs, and nature's going to select this. This is, this is the whole idea. that It was like a brainwave that Darwin had. It was like a sort of mechanism in nature that he, he thought of that, that was the engine to drive change. So if you happen to be born with bigger this or stronger that or longer this or shorter that or whatever's useful to you in your environment, nature will... Always pick what is best at surviving and best at leaving more offspring. And so on we go. Now, he, he hadn't at that stage discovered genetics. But when genetics came along, they just added it into Darwinism. It was called Neo-Darwinism. And so the idea is now we have two things that we combine together. We have genetic mutation and natural selection. So let's just say, uh, 
let's go back to the, to the polar bear. Mr. and Mrs. Polar Bear get together, and uh, there's a slight change in the sperm, in the gamete, as it is uh, involved in reproduction. And that slight genetic mistake in the DNA in the sperm turns out to confer some kind of advantage on the offspring. Thicker hair, or faster running, or whatever it is. And that gene and most genetic mistakes are obviously not very helpful, but so every, every now and again a helpful one will come along. And so this mutation in the genes, this change, is beneficial. Nature says, I'll have some of that. And we drive on as the engine of evolution. That is the theory of evolution. Now, let's go back to what Dawkins said. The appearance of design. So when I look at the fast legs of a gazelle in the jungle, it looks like God gave him fast legs to run away from cheetahs. But it wasn't like that at all. He developed those fast legs by genetic mutation, and, and nature just came along and only allowed the fastest ones to survive. And so it looks like design, but it's not design at all. It's nothing of the sort. Natural selection and mutation is just the engine that drives all this forward. Now think what they're claiming here. I don't know whether any of you guys work or girls work on uh, software. C can you imagine going into the boardroom at Microsoft in Seattle <laughs> and saying to Bill Gates or whoever else is running it now, I've got this new idea. You know, we can drive our Windows programs forward by this new free lunch idea that I've come with. What we need to do, instead of coming into work and actually trying to think of new ways to improve the software, we just need to come in every Monday morning and just make a whole bunch of mistakes. You know, we've got all this complicated code, uh, HTML, isn't that what they call it? Um, so... So that when you hit the letter P on the, on the, on the keyboard, up comes the P on it. That, that's coded for in the, in the HTML. Well, why don't we just make some random changes? And we just introduce loads of genetic, uh, loads of coding changes in here, and we'll draw it. You'd be immediately shown the door. Say, no, we don't go for mistakes. That, that's what viruses make. We don't go for anything like that. We need people to come in here and design things. They don't just happen by mistake. So... Evolution is a theory that proposes that everything you see around you is the result of billions and billions of mistakes. Genetic mutations, a change, a mistake in your DNA. Now, let me read you what Professor... D.M.S. Watson wrote in Nature. Nature is a leading scientific journal. <clears throat> Evolution is a theory universally accepted not because it can be proven by logically coherent evidence to be true, but because the only alternative, special creation, is clearly incredible. So here we have two alternatives. Special creation or evolution by genetic mutation and natural selection. And the guys that believe this are openly acknowledging that ultimately, let's say 50% of the reason they believe it is because they don't want to believe this. It's the only show in town. So Mr. Dawkins lives in Oxford, he's still alive, contemporary atheist. He writes in the front of his book, The Blind Watchmaker, that Darwin made it possible to be an intellectually fulfilled atheist. What a staggering statement. Do you see what he's saying? Prior to Darwin, we had to just kind of hope for the best, that there was some way in which evolution... Now we've really got a plausible story. No, is it really true? Well, I'm going to give you four reasons why it cannot be true. 
this whole fairy tale for grown-ups. This emperor's got no clothes meta-narrative that by billions of accidents over billions of years in one of billions of universes here we all are today to say aren't we wonderful and we've come a long way haven't we right four reasons why it is not possible now just forgive me I'm, by saying the first reason is the Bible won't allow it, I'm not saying that's just one of many reasons. That's obviously the big reason. If the Bible's against it, we don't need any other reasons. But I'm putting that first because there are people today who are trying to tell us that we can have creation and evolution together. It's called theistic evolution. God and we'll, we'll mix them all up and we'll get Genesis 1 and we'll stretch it and we'll pull it and we'll push it and we'll... we'll have a, a version of evolution and creation. No, the Bible is not going to allow evolution at all in that sense. So four reasons why this whole theory is not going to work. The Bible won't allow it. Genetics won't allow it. The fossil record won't allow it. Nature's complexity won't allow it. Right. First of all, the Bible won't allow it. Let me give you three reasons why the Bible will not allow us to believe in the theory of evolution. Turn to Genesis chapter 1. Let me ask you a question. According to Genesis, which came first, the birds or the reptiles? According to Genesis 1, the birds came first. If you look down in Genesis chapter 1, you'll find that the birds and the fish were created on day 5. Look at verse 20. God said, let the waters bring forth and so on. You've got the birds and the fish creating there, and that was day 5. Five, verse 23, evening in the morning with day five. So get this fixed in your head now. According to Genesis chapter one, <coughs> birds were created on day five. When were the reptiles created? Okay, reptiles were created on day six, verse uh, 24. God said, let the earth bring forth the living creature. Now then, what does evolution say? Where did the birds come from according to evolution? If you've never heard this, you're going to be surprised. Evolution says that birds evolved from dinosaurs. I have a book at home which I bought in the Natural History Museum, and on the front cover it has a picture of a Tyrannosaurus rex and a red-breasted robin. Now, that's probably provocative, but that's what I got in the Natural History Museum. So they say that these reptilian creatures with scales evolved the scales into feathers and took off. So which is right? Is the Bible right when it said the birds came before the reptiles? Or is evolution right when it says the reptiles evolved into... It cannot both be right. You say, well, if we make these days millions... Of, it doesn't matter how many millions of years you make each day. They're in the wrong order. Well, let me show you another one. When did the whales get created? God created great whales. Now, the people who live in Wales think that verse is wonderful, but it's not spelt the same. <laughs> W-H, ales, whales. When did God create the whales? He created the whales on day five. Verse 21, God created great whales. When did God create mammals? You say, well, the whale is a mammal. Just hold on a minute. When did God create land-based mammals? Cows and sheep and dogs and so on. Verse 24. God said, let the earth bring forth the living creature. So fix this in your head now. According to the Bible, whales that swim in the sea, created on day five, land-based mammals, dogs and cows and so on, they're created on day six. What does evolution believe? Now, if you've never heard this before, you're going to be surprised. The evolutionists believe that millions of years ago, a fish crawled out of the sea and turned its fins into feet somehow by genetic mutation and natural selection and walked out of the sea. So the fish turned into an amphibian. The amphibian then, slowly over a period of time, turned into a reptile. The reptile eventually turned into a mammal. 
There's no whales yet. No dolphins. They haven't come yet. Then one of these mammals decided, you know what? I'm going back to the sea. <laughs> and he turned his legs back into fins and all the rest of it. And so the whales actually came from the mammals. So they came out of the sea, and did a whole big cycle, and went back again. Which means it contradicts Genesis 1. Genesis 1 says the whales were on day 5, the mammals were on day 6. Evolution says the whales came from the mammals. The Bible will not allow the theory of evolution. Point two. That's the reason why, number one, why the Bible won't allow it. It's the order in Genesis is wrong. The second thing is, the Bible makes it clear that human body parts were designed. You say, well, doesn't kind of Darwin and kind of believe that? No, 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 no. Have you ever heard of vestigial organs? It's nothing to do with music. A vestigial organ is the name given by evolutionists, to certain parts of your body which you don't need anymore and they are left over from when you were a fish or an ape or whatever you were on the way through. So back in Darwin's day, it was believed that human beings had 100 vestigial organs. Can you imagine? Thinking to yourself that I've got 100 leftovers. I'm carrying around 100 leftovers from when I was an ape or a fish or whatever I was. Now that contradicts the Bible. Because what did we read in the Bible? God hath set the members in the body as it has pleased him. So evolution says, no, God hasn't set the members in the body. Half the members of your body are leftovers. You don't even need them anymore. No, no, says the Bible. God set them there. Let me show you a vestigial organ. Well, there isn't a vestigial organ. Let me show you uh, what they call a vestigial organ. The coccyx. Say, I never heard of such a thing. Where's my coccyx? Well, that's actually the horizontal. If you turn that that way... It's right down the bottom of your spine. Right on the very, very bottom of your spine. Ah, oh, says Mr. Darwin. That's your tail. That's from when you were a monkey. Or an ape. They can always put you right if you say monkey. They say, no, no, we never said we were monkeys. We were apes. The monkeys are a different branch. So you have to say apes. That's when you were an ape. When you used to swing in the trees. That's your tail. You don't need it. In the coccyx, take your toxic away. You don't need your coccyx, that's just a leftover. We have a surgeon in our assembly. He's an he's a, um, orthopedic surgeon. I thought, I'm going to ask him about this. I said, Josh, what's a coccyx for? <laughs> oh, yes, brother. He says, um, it's a bit embarrassing. I said, go on, try me. Well, he said, every now and again, we have to remove somebody's coccyx. And I said, oh, yeah, okay. But, you know, it's a bit delicate. I said, well, what's delicate? <laughs> well, well, let me just put it like this. We have to retrain them to go to the bathroom. I said, what, what do you mean? He said, well, well, you need that for when you go to the bathroom. Let me just, you know, say no more. You need it. It, it kind of holds you together. So you, if you take it away, you need to be completely retrained in that area. I said, okay, tell me no more. Tell me no more. <laughs> he was telling me that the coccyx is needed. It's needed during childbirth. It's needed when you go to the bathroom. It's, it's not a vestigial organ. Neither are your tonsils or your appendix. Or, uh, and, do you know I read, there's a guy called Jerry Coyne. C-O-Y-N-E. He wrote a book called Why Evolution is True. So I read it. Like a fool, I read it. <laughs> he, he says in that book that we can wiggle our ears because we used to be apes or whatever it was. 
you know, you see, the, you see them doing this and getting rid of flies and all this kind of thing. And it says, we don't need to wiggle our ears anymore. But the fact that we can wiggle our ears proves evolution. Have you ever been in an airplane? You ever wanted to wiggle your ears? I do it all the time. You, you're going up and it's the pressure and you do all this. But the fact that you can wiggle your ears is all part of the design of God. There is nothing redundant in the human body. It cannot be. The Bible tells us they have all been placed there. And yet, you know, Mr. Darwin said, Mr. Darwin listed three big reasons why he believed his theory was true. One was vestigial organs. He was absolutely convinced that vestigial organs proved that we came from, from uh, lower species. The second reason was something he called homology. What is homology? Homology is simply saying that there are similar structures in animals. So he would line up the forearm of a rat, a dog, a horse, a bat, a mole, a porpoise, and a man. He would say, they're all the same. Well, we know they're not all exactly the same, but the, the major parts are the same. And he would just say, well, look, it's pretty obvious. I mean, is God a boring designer that's lacking creativity? I mean, if you were God, would you make everybody's forearm pretty much the same? Obviously, you wouldn't do that. I mean, that would just be ridiculous. Uh, so so that, this must prove that it's common descent. We've all got the similar uh, forearm and so on because we all come from a similar ancestor. Well, it all depends how you want to look at it. Common design is every bit as plausible as common descent. Why could God not have DNA-based life throughout the whole of the animal kingdom. Why could God not uh, have a similar design? To, to imagine that that is one of the three major proofs of evolution is scratching around. There's, there's no proof at all. The third major proof, in fact, this is what he called the next one. I'll, I'll bring a slide up here. It's called embryonic development. Phylogeny recapitulates ontology, if you want the fancy word for it. Darwin called this what I'm going to talk to you about now. By far, the strongest evidence in favor of my theory. He wrote that in a letter on September the 10th to a fellow called Asa Gray. So what is the theory? Okay, so look at the very top line of this slide. The top line of this slide is a hand drawing. It's not a photograph. It's not a microscopic photograph. It is a hand-drawn diagram of various different embryos of various different creatures. It was drawn by the man in the picture, Ernst Haeckel, a liar, a fraudulent... I have no words for him. <laughs> Ernst Haeckel from Germany. Now, let me tell you what creatures he's drawn there. He chose very carefully, there's certain ones he left out, he chose humans, dogs, seals, and bats. Let me get them here. Now, here we go. Salamander, turtle, chicken, rabbit, and human. Okay, I've got a different list here for some reason. Okay, so he's, he, he's drawn these across. The, see the way he's drawn them at the top? He has drawn them, well, you would think from watching them, that, wow, that's incredible, they're all they're pretty much the same. And for people who didn't know any, this man, Haeckel, he used to travel around like a sort of traveling circus, and he would take, he would take out, um, he would rent a town hall, and he'd put pictures, he would put this picture up on the wall. And people who didn't know any better, who weren't scientists, would come, and they would look at it. And they would think, wow, that's amazing. When I was in my mother's womb, I looked exactly the same at the start as a rabbit, as a chicken, as a turtle, as a salamander, as a... <clears throat> and it was like, that's... Well, that, probably, that must prove that we just evolved then. I mean, if I was totally different, I was made in the image of God and I'm special and all this, surely I wouldn't look like a rabbit, surely I wouldn't look like a fish. And then... Mr. Haeckel said, well, as we go through and we grow up to be a big, ready-to-be-born embryo, through that, we go back through the stages of evolution. So, at a certain part of our journey through the womb, we're like a fish, and we have little gill slits. 
as a baby and the women. And then we're like this and we're like that and, and, we, and we recapitulate our evolution. It was all a complete fraud. But not before it hadn't been in the textbooks of every school in the, in the Western world and had convinced people, including... Darwin went to his grave thinking this was the greatest proof of his theory ever invented, and it was a fraud. You say, how do you know it's a fraud? Okay, I'm going to show you now another slide. And on this next slide, this is an, a picture across the top, same as that, and then underneath an actual photograph of what these little early embryos actually look like. So across the top is Haeckel's drawings. Underneath is a photograph of what they actually look like. So Mr. Haeckel falsified. It is a total fraud. Even evolutionists have been openly admitting how shocked they are that this man went around proselytizing for Darwinism with fraudulent drawings. He should have been in jail. So here's the real truth. Darwin's marvelous fact was a fiction and a fraud. Now, the third reason why the Bible won't allow it. So the Bible won't allow it because the order in Genesis 1 is different. The Bible won't allow it because the human body is designed. It's not leftovers from evolution. The Bible won't allow it because... The Bible says animals and plants and humans reproduce after their kind. You say, well, what, 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 how does that contradict evolution? Well, evolution says that you can reproduce different kinds. Time goes by, and so a fish keeps reproducing. Eventually, there's a different kind of animal completely. Uh, uh, there's a... There's a Amphibian, and then an amphibian reproduces a different kind of animal, a reptile, and then a reptile keeps producing, and a different kind of animal comes a mammal, and then a, a different kind of bird, and so on. So evolution is saying that you can reproduce different kinds. The Bible is saying that you reproduce according to your kind. So you can't have both. Now let me just look at this whole subject of kinds and species, because this is absolutely vital to get our heads around this. When does this meeting finish? Eight o'clock, is it? Okay. Have you ever heard of this thing called taxon taxonomy? Okay, taxonomy is the science of categorizing all the animals and plants in the world. So, if you can see this chart, at the top you've got the biggest layer of the taxonomic table. So we're, we're looking here at kingdoms. So you've got the animal kingdom. You've got the plant kingdom. So the, we're now looking at very, very broad uh, categories. So if, if, I pick up a, if I pick up a cat, I say, right, I want to put this into the taxonomic table. Well, it's going to be in the animal kingdom. At least we know that. The cat's going to be in the animal kingdom. It's not going to be in the plant kingdom. So now, now we're going to come down. Where are we going to put this cat? Well, let's not talk about a cat because that's not a cat. Let's talk about a fox. So here's, here's a, a creature called a red fox. So we want to put this fox into the taxonomic table. So it's an animal. So it's going to be in the animal kingdom. It's got a backbone. So it's in the core data phylum. What class is it in? Oh, it's a mammal. It's a warm-blooded animal. So we'll stick it in this group that we've called mammals. What kind of... Uh, what does it eat? It's a carnivore. What family is it in? It's in the, it's in the canid family. And we're getting, we're getting right, 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 right down. And this is how every single plant and animal in the whole of nature has been classified. Scientists have, sometimes it's very difficult when they come across a duckbill platypus or something and they're not sure where to put it, but, but most animals, they, 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 they've drawn up this elaborate taxonomic table and, and every creature in the world that they've ever discovered, they give it one of these names. So we, we are Homo sapiens. So that's, everybody has this double-barreled name. Now, Genesis 1, creatures 
reproduce after their kind. Now, you see, the Bible doesn't use the word species. It doesn't use the word genus. It doesn't use the word family. It uses this word kind. So, so exactly where does that fit on there? Well, we can't be dogmatic because this was just invented as a classification instrument by, by scientists and Genesis had kinds in view and that's it. So sometimes what we call a species would be called a kind. Sometimes what we call a genus would be, occasionally what we call a family would be a kind. Let me just explain. You see, when somebody says to you, do you believe in evolution, just be careful what you say. Because it depends what they mean. It's quite possible that zebras and horses and donkeys are all from the same pair of animals that were created in the Garden of Eden. It's quite possible. It's quite possible that God created an original kind and zebras and horses and donkeys have developed from that original kind. You say, hang on a minute, that sounds like evolution. Just hang on a minute. It's quite possible that lions and tigers and leopards, it's possible, because you can actually interbreed them to a degree, came from an original pair of animals. It's possible. It's possible that wolves and dingoes and dogs all came from an original. You do know that there were no poodles in the Garden of Eden, right? You know that. <laughs> it's quite possible that there's this original dog kind. You can breed a tame dog from a wolf in a very short space of time. I once saw a program on that, how they just kept selecting the tamest one from the, from the litter, and within no time at all, they went from a wolf to a pet dog in the house. So that's caused by human intervention. But it's quite possible that these animals came from an original kind. So what am I saying? The Bible allows for variation within a kind. Just look around the room, okay? Do I need to say more? There's variation within a kind. We have all shapes, we have all sizes, we have all colours, we have all hair types, some have no hair at all, we have all kinds of differences. I mean, it's quite amazing when you think, go to the Guinness Book of Records, look at the tallest person, the shortest person. It's staggering the amount of variation within the humankind that is possible, and yet we're all exactly the same DNA. So variation within a kind is possible. You say, well, then, what are you saying? Well, somebody has coined a, a phrase, microevolution. So if you like this expression, that you, you could say we believe in microevolution, if as long as we're understanding that we're in the realm of the Bible saying after their kind. So what does evolution say? Ah, evolution says something completely different. Evolution says that bats and buttercups and bananas and Beethoven all come from a common ancestor. So if you had a banana for breakfast this morning, you were eating your ancestors. <laughs> so when you go out to mow the lawn, I guess you're mowing your relatives. I mean, it can be nothing else. You're related to everything on planet Earth. Of course, this feeds into the whole animal rights thing and veganism and all that, you understand that? You say, right, okay, so, so we believe, according to the Bible, that as long as it's after the kind, there's, there's, there's a certain amount of plasticity there, there's a certain amount of variation. As long as we're in the kind, that's biblical. But evolution is saying you can have a completely different kind. Absolutely. So evolution is saying, it's called the tree of life. Evolution is saying that all of nature is like a tree. And we're a branch over here, and the zebras are a branch over here, and corn on the cob is, is a branch over here, and E. coli is a branch over here. But if you go back and back and back and back and back, you come to this one single ancestor where it all started. So you say, well, what does our model look like? Well, you need to be careful here because... The evolutionists mock what we believe because they don't understand what we believe. This is what they think we believe. 
They think we believe. So we're going back to the Garden of Eden at the bottom, and we're going up to 2015 at the top on this. So what they think we believe is that there were poodles in the Garden of Eden, and there were Alsatians in the Garden of Eden, and there was every single species that is alive today was represented in the garden. God made all these different types of dogs, and all these different types of cichlid fish, and every variety of, 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 of uh, human and animal and plant. And then slowly, through species dying off, we got less and less and less. Now, that's not what we believe at all. The Bible teaches that at the beginning, God created some basic kinds of animals. So again, there were no poodles on Noah's Ark. There were no Alsatians on There was a basic pair of dogs on Noah's Ark. Two dogs. And from those basic kinds, there's variation within the kinds, but one kind cannot change into a totally different kind. Now, the difference is this. On the top of your screen, you can see a Chihuahua and a Great Dane. What's the difference between them? You say, well, they're just completely different. No, 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 they're not completely different. Well, see, they look different to me. Well, they're different in shape, they're different in size, they're different in speed, they're different in strength, they're different in color, but they are both 100% dog. And they have exactly the same bone parts. They are, if you dug them up as, as um, fossils, you might not think, but they are actually in the same kind of animal. Amazing, but true. Now look at the bottom two. Ah, oh, now that's completely different. That's a reptile and a mammal. Can a reptile turn into a mammal? No, it can't. Well, why not? Because to turn a reptile into a mammal isn't just changing its shape, isn't just changing its color, isn't just changing its... No, 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 no. To change... Um, a reptile into a mammal, you've got to do things like this. You've got to evolve a new chamber in the heart. Can you imagine? Can you imagine how you'd survive that? Evolving a new chamber in your heart. You have to evolve mammary glands and a milk supply. You have to evolve a hair covering. You have to evolve a temperature control system because you're going to be going from being cold-blooded to being warm-blooded. You're going to have to evolve a corti in the inner. You're going to have to evolve a diaphragm. Do you see what's happening here? We're not just talking about variation within a kind. We're not talking about two types of dogs or two types of humans, which is allowed for in the Bible. We're talking about a theory that says one kind of animal can totally change into a completely different kind of animal, and all its bodily parts have to go. So let's go back to this idea of the whale. Now, of course, evolution can't agree which mammal turned back into a whale. Some say it was a hippopotamus-like creature. Others say it was this like creature. There is, there is a group of Japanese scientists who say that it was a hyena-like creature. Now just think about this for a minute. A hyena-like creature, something like a hyena, turned into a whale. And you say, wow, that's quite the story. Yeah, that is quite the story. So that means that the front legs of the hyena-like creature have to turn into pectoral fins. His back legs have to disappear. He has to develop a dorsal fin. He has to replace all his hair with blubber. He has to get rid of his bony tail and turn it into a cartilaginous flute. The nostrils on his nose have to migrate up to the top of his head. His external ears have to disappear and become internal and change into ears that can stand high-pressure diving. And he has to grow from a little hyena-like creature to where he weighs 80,000 pounds. The Bible won't allow it. But not only will the Bible not allow it, Genetics will not allow it. There's our lovely friend, DNA. Those various arrows are just taking you from the big DNA 
and they're taking out the nucleus, and then they're going into the nucleus, taking out the chromosome, and then they're taking a tiny little bit of the chromosome, which is a gene, and spreading out. There's a gene on your right. So that's your complete cell. Take out the nucleus, have a look at the chromosomes, and there's one little strand of the double helix DNA, which is a gene. Now, when you give birth to a child, it is because the chromosomes from the mom and the chromosomes of the dad have come together and coded for that next generation. So what these evolutionists are saying is, we just have a little change in the DNA, a mutation, and then the next generation is slightly different to the previous one. And you keep changing and changing and changing, and that's how all this change takes place. Now, genetics won't allow that. That is a fairy story. Do you, know what, do you know what the main function of the DNA is actually to do? To actually resist change. God has so designed it that it doesn't like change. Mutations happen in your body every day. And you know what your body does with them? It zaps them. And if it doesn't zap them, do you know what happens? You get cancer. Mutations are something the body doesn't like. That's why you should eat good food instead of junk food, so that your body is healthy. Though this is not an advert for healthy uh, uh, oat cake biscuits or whatever, but this is just saying that whatever goes in here is what your body has to build itself with. The changes that take place are almost always horribly harmful. So let me give you some genetic mutations. Hemophilia, that is a genetic mutation. Down syndrome, sickle cell anemia, muscular dystrophy, cystic fibrosis. There's a list of over 4,000 diseases. And how do they come about? When you get a change, an error, a mutation of some kind in that. What, what, what's happening here? We're learning that Mutations in the DNA don't usually help you, they usually hinder you. It's a disaster when you get a big change in your DNA. And even when... Yeah, let me just uh, put up a slide here. This is where a lot of people go wrong. So, you're listening to the news, and uh, the guy comes on the news and says, Oh, the bad news, really bad news. There's a new strain of of bacteria that has developed. It has evolved resistance to bacteria. It's a superbug. And now we're in trouble because if this gets out, we've got no defenses. It's evolved. And of course, as soon as you hear, so it's evolved into a superbug. Wow. It gives the impression that this bacteria is really going places. <laughs> uh, it's developed muscles. You know, this is now a superbug. And well, doesn't that prove evolution? <laughs> well, if you can follow this, I know it's late in the day, it's quarter to eight, but just, just hear me out here because this is absolutely the core issue with genetics. Okay, so let's just say you get a bacterial infection. What should we, what should we, um, what should we do? Well, let's say you get a, a bacterial infection that, that you go to the doctor and he says, I know what we're going to give you. We're going to give you streptomycin. Say, so what's that? It's an antibiotic. We should be very thankful for antibiotics. Can you imagine living before they were invented? Wonderful things, antibiotics. So you go into the doctor and he says, oh yeah, I can see you've got this, this bacterial infection. We'll give you streptomycin. So you swallow down this streptomycin. What does the streptomycin do? It goes down to your body, and it finds this terrible bacteria that's giving you a problem. And it goes inside the bacterium, this antibiotic, it goes inside, and it wrecks the ribosome's ability to make proteins. It goes in there, and it just destroys the ribosome's ability. So when that bacteria, bac those bacteria in your body that are making you feel sick, when they try and produce more and more and more and overcome your immune system, they can't do it. Because this streptomycin has come in and just knocked them on the head, just completely zapped their ability. To, so eventually you just say, oh, I feel a lot better now. 
That's because of the work that the streptomyces is up. Ah, but something can happen. Sometimes, these little nasty critters, these, these bacteria, they can have a mutation in their system that changes the shape of the ribosome in there. So you go to the doctor, you don't know that this is now a superbug that's changed the shape of the ribosome inside it, and you say, doctor, I'm feeling sick. And he looks at you and he says, oh, I know just the thing. And he gives you some streptomycin, and you take it down, and the streptomycin goes down into your body. This is totally unscientific language. Excuse me if there's any doctors or nurses here. It goes down into your body, and it goes into the... Uh, it goes into the bacteria and it says, where are those ribosomes? And it's just about to wreck them and when it gets to them, it says, oh boy, it's changed shape. And it's unable to destroy the reproductive capacity of that bacteria. And the evolutionists say, see? Evolution! But hang on a sec, hang on a sec. How does it what actually happens when that mutation takes place in the bacteria and it changes shape? This is what happens. It loses genetic information. It loses genetic complexity. Dr. Lee Spetner, who I've quoted on the foot, says, resistance is gained. So the bacteria gains resistance to the streptomycin not by adding something, but by losing it. So rather than say that the bacterium gained resistance to the antibiotic, we would be more correct to say that it lost sensitivity to it. It'd be like this. Imagine if the police came in here with handcuffs. 300 pairs of handcuffs. And let's say I had an accident and I've got no arms or hands. And the police come in with handcuffs and they want to arrest everybody. And they arrest you and you and you and they arrest everybody. They come to me and they can't arrest me. I've got an advantage over you lot. They can't arrest me, not with those handcuffs, they can't. They might do something with my feet, but they, they can't do to me what they're doing to you because I've got an advantage, have I? Have I got an advantage? I've got no arms, no hands. You see, it gives me an advantage to that particular situation, but it's not an adding of information. I've lost inf That is what it's happening. So next time you hear on the news, Oh, this, this bacteria has evolved and it's now resistant. Oh, that's not proof of evolution. It's, it's just a loss of genetic information. Now I see that time is rushing on. So I'm going to miss out a few bits and bobs here. Evolution cannot be true because the Bible won't allow it. Genetics won't allow it. I want to move on now to the fossil record. The fossil record will not allow it. You say, wow, that's amazing. I thought that was the strongest point. I, I thought this was the whole geologic column and all these dinosaurs, and I thought that's how they prove it. No, no, no. The geologic record is on the Bible side. It has to be. You know what Mr. Darwin said? Let me quote you what Darwin said from his own book, The Origin of Species. Why is not every geological formation and every stratum, so every layer, he's saying, why are they not full of intermediate links? Okay, so if a, if a fish turned into an amphibian and a reptile, there should be, buried in rock layers all over the world, all the intermediate stages. So the legs, you should be see, able to see them growing longer and longer and longer and longer. And then you should see the wings starting a little bit, a little bit more, a little bit more, a little bit more, then full wings. And you should be able to follow this. It should, be, it should be just written everywhere. Every time you dig one up, every second one should be a... Intermediate. Why are they not there? Says Mr. Darwin, geology assuredly does not reveal any such finely graduated organic chain. And this, perhaps, is the most obvious and gravest objection which can be urged against my theory. So what did the evolutionists say? They said, well, yes, that is true. But our problem is that we've got an incomplete fossil record. And just give us a bit of time and we'll dig up all the fossils and we'll, we'll find it. So they dug and they dug and they dug and they dug. Until 1977, well over 100 years later, there's a man in America, his name is Stephen J. Gould. He was a 
famous atheistic paleontologist, evolutionist, <coughs> biologist, very, very influential. He was the kind of Richard Dawkins of, of America. In fact, him and Richard Dawkins fell out big time. He knew much more about fossils than Dawkins because he was a paleontologist. So he spends every day digging up the ground, looking up, looking at bones, looking at fossilized creatures. And Stephen Jay Gould, he's an atheist, doesn't believe in God. He thinks there's no purpose to life. But as he looks at all these um, bones, he's thinking to himself, the traditional theory of evolution cannot be right. <laughs> Because every time we dig up an animal, it's a fully formed animal. It's quite clear. You know, we're hoping that we're going to dig up all these middle guys, these missing things, but we're not digging up missing things. We're just digging up fully formed, fully functional animals. Occasionally we get a mosaic, like a duckbill platypus, where it seems like, you know, it's a bird with a claw or something like Archaeopteryx. But even then, it's a fully formed claw, so that doesn't, that doesn't count. And so he actually said, you know, we're going to have to give up on this evolution theory, and he brought up a new theory. You know, when, when they say to us the Christians can't agree, you just tell them that evolutionists can't agree. So he came up with this new theory, he called it punctuated equilibrium. Don't they have some lovely names? Punctuate. What was punctuated equilibrium? What Stephen Gould said was, if we're being honest, looking at the fossils, it didn't happen gradually over millions of years, they changed a little bit, a little bit, a little bit. It's quite obvious they must have changed suddenly punctuated. That's the word. So history, says he, it goes stasis. It just goes steady for a while. All the animals stay the same. And then there's a punctuation. The equilibrium is knocked out of it. And there's a big jump in complexity. And we get a load more new animals. And then it slows down again. And we go along for a while. Then there's another punctuation. He's getting very near creation, isn't he? He was an honest paleontologist. Says he, I love this quote. This is Stephen Jay Gould writing in 1977. The extreme rarity of transitional fossils in the fossil record persists, now listen to this, as the trade secret of paleontology. <laughs> you see what he's saying there? The average Joe, the average poor old guy that sits watching NBC, or whatever it is, NBC or CBN or whatever you have over here, Canadian broadcasters, CBN, is that, that what sounds right? CBC. CBC, okay. The average Joe who sits watching CBC, he thinks, he thinks in his ignorance that there's all these intermediates and it's all been a steady, slow change over. But we guys who are the professional paleontologists, we guys who dig up, we guys who examine, we know the trade secret. And the trade secret is... There aren't hardly any forms of creature that you can make a watertight case for that's actually transitional. So we have, oh, this, this one here. Well, I must stop. Do you know when Richard Dawkins w went into the room to look at tick, tick to lick, which they claim is the missing link between fish and fish, he broke down in tears. Can you imagine? This is Professor Dawkins. Amateurist professor of zoology or whatever. He goes into this lab somewhere and here's this fossilized fish <laughs> with a bit of a head and half a ragtail of a body. And he says, Granddad, I've, this is it. <laughs> this is the first one of my ancestors that walked out of the sea and he burst into tears. <laughs> Why do they think it's a missing link? You see these little things here? They think that's a fin half turning into a leg. You know, they used to say that about another one called the coelacanth. You ever heard of the coelacanth? They had this, they found this fossil, 65 million years old. It's a fish. And it has these little, oh, they're proto legs. They're just, just half fin, half leg, and he's kind of crawling out of the sea. This is it, this is the missing link. And they called it the coelacanth. And it went extinct, 65 minutes, but it's a missing link. <laughs> so this guy's off on a fishing trip in Japan. It's a few years ago. And he's fishing up these fish, and he pulls up this 
well, I've never seen one of these before. Takes it along to the local... Uh-oh. <laughs> it was a coelacanth. They said it's a living fossil. <laughs> they got nothing between 65 million years and today. And they looked at the little... They weren't legs. They're what's called lobe fins. <clears throat> so you can waddle along the... the the sea bed if they want to. Nothing to do with crawling out of the sea. If, if that coelacanth crawled out of the sea, it would die, because it can't breathe air. This tick to leg, it's not a missing link. Oh, dear. <laughs> Archaeoptics, we haven't got time to do him. That's a real bird. So there's another bird. That's a living bird, a Watson, that has a claw on its wings. A claw on a wing doesn't mean a bird's not a bird. What are you going to do with this one? You ever seen one of those duck bill platypus? It has fur and it suckles its young like a mammal. It lays eggs like a reptile. It has webbed feet and a bill like a duck. And it has a poisonous spur on its rear leg like a snake's fang. What are you going to do with that? I think that's God's joke on the evolutionists. <laughs> Wales. I'm going to finish with this one and then we'll just, I'm going to go five minutes over the time. So I went to the National History Museum. Never went back. I went there once. First thing that meets you is this dinosaur. Millions of years old. So I went to the Darwin exhibit. Then I went to the evolution exhibit. Everybody's wandering around in hushed tones. These are the ancestors. You go, you go from, from, from cage to cage, from, from, from exhibit to exhibit. So I took these pictures with my own camera. See that character there on the left, on the right? You know what she's called? Lucy. Yeah, she's called Lucy. You know why they called her Lucy? Because when they were in Africa, Mr. Richard Leakey, when he was digging around, the moment they dug her out of the ground, they were playing on the radio, the Beatles song, Lucy in the Sky with Diamonds. <laughs> Let's call her Lucy. Do you know, I stood opposite Lucy and I had a look at her and I thought, this, this is unbelievable. They are devils, these people, the way, they, the way they, they try and... Can you see her face? She's, she's sort of looking thoughtful, you know. Because she's the first big move away from apes to humans. This is the very, very, very first divergence from the African savanna. This is where we suddenly climbed down out of the trees and started walking upright and acting like humans. And well, they give her a very fancy name, Australopithecus afarensis. And they made her look very thoughtful. Can you see her hands? Beautiful looking human hands. Look, look at her feet. Absolutely perfect human feet. And I stood in front and I thought, this is... I need to get my head around this. So, so we got this little four-foot monkey-looking creature who has human feet. I, I don't... I said, Where's the skeleton? Where's the skeleton? So next, next to it, there's a skeleton. That's the skeleton. So I'm thinking, right, where, where's the feet? <laughs> So they've drawn human feet here. They, they've crafted them. This is, a, this is not the real thing. Okay, this is just a dummy. They made this. This is what they made it from. This is the, <laughs> this is what they, the plan they had to go on. I'm thinking, so there's no feet bones. None. So I'm thinking, right, so, so the human hands, they put human hands on this old monkey here. Where are the human hands? I was so angry. I wrote a letter to the museum. So I wrote to the, I wrote to the museum. I said, dear sir, <laughs> I've been looking at your afferent, uh, Australia particular. <laughs> it has human feet and human hands. I don't get it because you didn't have any bones for you. I mean, maybe there's other ones of these that have been found that have bones, but the one you've got certainly doesn't. So 
Tell me, how did you have the nerve to put human feet, clearly trying to get the message over to your people coming around that this is an ape with human feet, when you don't have the paleontological evidence? It's not there. I got a letter back. <laughs> Doctor, no, Professor, Professor Chris Stringer, head of human origins. Dear Michael, the display was put up before I became the head of human origins. <laughs> and then he referred me to this article and this article. Yeah. Oh. Just deliberate deception. Deliberate deception. This creature was not human, wasn't half human, wasn't at all human. It was an ape, didn't have human feet. They found other fossils later on that make that very, very clear. The Bible won't allow it. Genetics won't allow it. The fossil record won't allow it. Finally, nature's complexity won't allow it. I just love to talk about the complexity of nature because to me it just fills me with wonder at the, at the mighty power and creativity and wisdom and nature of God. So why have I put up this extinct creature called a trilobite? Well, I have put up a trilobite because evolutionists will tell you that this little creature, he's a small, he's a small creature, this little creature went extinct hundreds of billions of years ago. And you can find these little creatures in rocks that they call... Now, we believe the rocks were all laid down in the flood quickly. They were not done over millions of years. That's a, a story for another day. But they believe that these little trilobites were in... They are found in what they call the Cambrian rocks. Now, the Cambrian rocks are believed by evolutionists to be around 500 million years old. So it's like the, almost the very, very earliest rocks. So they've got lots of little animals in them. And in this little, in this layer of, of Cambrian rock, you've got these trilobites. Now look, look, look at his eye. So I've got a ring around the trilobite, so he has two eyes. There's a ring around it, and this is the eye of the trilobite blown up. So this is a very, very early creature. They're, they're, they're not really sure who the ancestors were because they, all these animals appear in the Cambrian rocks all of a sudden. Let me quote you what Andrew Snelling says about the trilobite's eye. Some scientists believe that the aggregate eyes of some trilobites were the most sophisticated optical systems ever utilized by an organism. The schizocroal eye, which is what you see there, is a compound eye made up of many single lenses, each one specifically designed to correct for spherical aberration, thus allowing the trilobites to see an undistorted image even when they're underwater. And trilobites appear in the geological record suddenly, fully formed with complex integrated creatures with the most sophisticated optical systems ever utilized, without any hint or any trace of an ancestor in the rock layers beneath. Now, wouldn't you have thought, if you're going back 500 million years, coming all the way up today, you'd start with a very, very simple eye, and you'd come up and up and up and up, and finally you'd get to us with the complicated eyes. No. There's complexity right from the very start. That's the opposite of the theory of evolution. Nature's complexity even now does not allow for evolution to explain it. But how on earth can you have that kind of... How is it that the most sophisticated optical system ever utilized by any creature that's ever existed was in the oldest rocks that they say? But you see... I'm going to finish with, with this one here. I just love this, this, this slide here. That's what we read in Psalm 94. He who formed the eye. Can he not just, can he not just 
Imagine in your mind God creating Adam. And he creates his skeleton, creates his internal organs, designs everything. And the feet and the hands and the thumb and the ears and the brain and the mind and all of it, it's all designed. And then, just at the right a distance from each other, just in, in the right uh, shape of the face, connected in the right way, with the right coloring and all the mechanisms, he, he formed the eye. As I mentioned earlier, Darwin used to call it an, an organ of extreme perfection. Have you ever thought what happens when you open your eyes in the morning? Your eye passes two trillion messages a second to your brain. Your eyes and your brain burn up 25% of your entire nutritional intake. 90% of the information that the brain sorts out every day comes through these eyes. So light comes in, it strikes your eye on the transparent cornea. And there's an iris in your eye located behind the cornea which controls the amount of light that enters your eye by changing the size of the pupil, that hole in the center of the eye that appears black. Once the proper amount of light has been admitted into the eye, it is then bent within the eye in order to focus. The cornea, because of its bulging surface, bends the light sharply towards the center of the eye. The light then reaches the tiny lens, which is about the size of a small bean. The lens consists of two thousand infinitely fine layers of transparent fiber, and after being focused by the lens, the light passes through the clear-like jelly substance that fills most of the interior of the eye. It's called vitreous humor. It's matched to the lens in a way that keeps light traveling in the same focused path. And finally, the light hits the back of the eye, the retina, this pink coating that covers the back of your eye. It's like the, the film in an old-fashioned camera. And packed into the retina, there are what is called rods and photocells. There's 125 million of them. And in each photocell, there's many, many mitochondria. These are little chemical factories which process 700 chemical substances along the surface of their membranes. So these photoreceptors in the back of your eye, they contain light-sensitive pigments. And yet this retina is as thin as a piece of paper. Thin as a piece of paper, yes, but it has ten layers. And the rods are mixed together throughout the retina, occupying the area about the size of a postage stamp. And these enable us to switch with ease between bright lights and dim lights, and they transform the light into signals, partly chemical, partly electrical. So when a photon of light hits the retina, it interacts with a molecule there called the 11 cis retinal, which then straightens it out. And these coded signals are then what are going straight into the brain. Now to carry the signals to the brain, the retinal nerve fibers come into play. So there's fibers in the back of, so it's like a speedo cable coming out of the back of your eye. The fibers create a complex interconnected network that fans out all over the back of the retina and collects all the data from the light that's coming in through the eye. And it collects it to one point, bunched together like a cable, passing out of the back of the eye. Now this is where things start to get complicated. <laughs> the optic nerves from the eye crisscross in the brain. Somehow they exchange information so that the images from the two eyes are coordinated into one stereoscopic field of vision. Then, a new set of specialized nerve fiber picks up the signals and carries them to the visual cortex in the back of the brain. And in this small mass of gray matter, something called seeing 
takes place. Billions of cells in the visual cortex add and combine and exchange and organize the visual data to produce a picture in your mind. And this process is not understood by scientists. So the cornea and the lens outstrip any camera ever designed. The electrical and chemical processes of the retina beat anything man can do in a laboratory. The brain, the cells and the visual cortex do the job no computer can ever come close to achieving. Oh, but I've only been talking about one eye. You've got two eyes. Placed just to the right distance from each other, on the same side of the head, complete with lashes and lids and tear ducts and sockets. And not only have you got two eyes, but you've got two ears and two arms and two legs and you've got kidneys and lungs and hands and feet. I will praise thee, says the psalmist, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous are thy works, and that my soul knoweth right well. What have we learned today? Truth finds its source in the God of truth. The universe was formed by the word of his mouth. Life was created by his life-giving power. And nature's species are the result of his wisdom and his power and his creative glory. All of nature speaks of the glory of our great God. Oh, that our hearts might rise in thanksgiving and worship to him. What a mighty maker we have. Let us close with a word of prayer. Our Father, we bless and praise thee tonight for the glory of God that we can see all around us in creation. We thank thee for this general revelation given to us in creation and in providence. And we thank thee too for that specific revelation given to us in the word of God that describes it to us in such glorious detail. We thank thee tonight that we can look up by faith and see in the glory of heaven a great eternal creator, omnipotent, omniscient, omnipresent, a mighty, holy, eternal I am. And we thank thee that our times are in thy hands. We thank thee for this meeting that we've had today, these various sessions. We pray that each one will go away with a greater appreciation of the greatness of God a greater appreciation of the wonder of the word of God and a greater thankfulness in our heart for the grace of our God to us in ever saving us and bringing unto know thee. So we look to thee for safe journeys home. Thank thee for any refreshment provided in the precious name of the Lord Jesus. Amen.